Cool. All right, well, let's get started with introductions and as people roll in, they can uh, catch on. Um, so yeah, so I'm Roxy. I am the chair of the AIC Sustainability Committee and I'm joined by Kate, who is my um, co colleague on the committee, the networking officer for us. And we're, um, and also Elena, who is our um, AIC rep. So thanks, Elena, for setting all this up. Um, and we're joined by two members of Museums for Future, Anna Krez and Maggie O'Donnell. And um, Anna is in Germany and um, is a co-founder of Museums for Future Germany. And Maggie is in New York City. So we have some American representation here as well. Uh, and she's at the Climate Museum. And I'm gonna let them uh, introduce themselves uh, because and speak a little bit about their interests. But um, before we do that, we just wanted to sort of, you know, say that we were interested in having this conversation because a lot of us feel quite stuck in our individual action. Um, and, you know, it's designed that way that we are, you know, meant to feel that this is all our responsibility and that, you know, you can, you have to do everything yourself when in fact, uh, you're set up to fail if you try to solve a global problem like this by yourself. And um, these two climate activists are doing some awesome work uh, to really like, I don't know, they're very empowering and very, um, you know, excited about this work. So um, we did time this event to coincide with the German elections, which just happened. So Anna can speak to that a little bit, perhaps. Uh, it's a really interesting and sort of um, difficult you know, situation there, but I think quite positive um, for, for the climate. So thanks Germany for leading the way as usual. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I just wanted to turn it over to Anna and then I guess Maggie to introduce themselves and tell us, you know, just a little bit about what got you interested in climate activism. I will say that Anna is responsible for convincing me to get my act together on uh, <laughs> becoming more active in this, in this sphere. So don't let anyone tell you that friends talking to people can't change things. Uh, not that I've changed all that much, but you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, so if Anna, you could just introduce yourself and talk a little bit about climate activism and just sort of the power of connecting to other people and, um, and then we'll hand it over to Maggie. Wow, expectations are really high right now. Thank you for that, Roxy. Um, so um, yeah, my name is uh, Anna Kretz. I'm a freelance paintings conservator in Heidelberg, Germany. Um, I'm also um, teaching um, students at the University of Applied Science in Karlsruhe and others here in Germany about sustainability, climate action, um, critical thinking, all sorts of things, uh, change making, I guess. Um, uh, so yeah, and I um, co-founded Museums for Future Germany um, actually just a couple of months ago. We had our four month anniversary, uh, I guess, last week. Uh, so we did celebrate a little bit. And as you said, uh, we also had um, elections in Germany, uh, which I'm happy to talk about uh, probably a little later. Um, should I hand over to Maggie for introductions and then yeah. come back? That sounds great. Hi, so I'm Maggie O'Donnell. I'm the research um, and program associate at the Climate Museum, but I also um, joined Museums for Future um, almost, I guess, like November 2020. So I'm not quite at my, my year anniversary. Um, and I really joined it um, as part of this like longer trajectory of moving from feeling like climate action, like you were saying, Roxy, was like this personal thing that if I talked about it with other people, um, it would like make me a Debbie Downer in the conversation or something like that. Um, and you know, it's been a, a longer journey and arc towards seeing climate action as something that is really hopeful and brings a lot of like, you know, uh, like a rational sense of optimism um, to your perspective on now and the future. Um, and so through working with Museums for Future on the newsletters, um, I, it's been really exciting to see how climate action in like an international context and also like um, the collaborations and conversations that can take place um, outside of just uh, New York City where the Climate Museum is based. That's awesome, thank you both. Um, and I just wanted to say, you know, this is a technically an Ask an Expert series. So uh, if anybody who's listening wants to ask some questions, throw them in the chat and we will um, definitely ask them. We've got a couple of questions to start us off. And as the conversation progresses, I'm sure more, more ideas will pop up. But um, Kate, do you wanna ask our first question? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. I also just want to say that I am uh, multitasking right now. I'm home with my sick um, son. So if you hear anything in the background, 
that's what's going on. Um, but so far, so good. <clears throat> so we've touched upon this a little bit, um, but there is really that, um, you know, like emphasis sort of within the media and within a lot of the information that we are given about the climate crisis that really focuses on our individual actions. Um, and so we really wanted to talk about ways that we can expand our reach and get away from that idea. Um, so I don't know if you want to touch on that idea or, um, you know, either of you can really cite actions that you've taken that have been particularly successful and inspiring that have been, um, you know, more about, you know, a group action or inspiring others, you know, what are some ways that we can kind of get away from feeling like it's just all on us and all on the individual? Um, and I'm happy for either of you to just start. I can jump in first um, and then uh, pass it over to you, Anna. Um, so I think one of the actions um, that has been really important to me, first and foremost, and like what you just said, Roxy, talking about climate, um, one of the statistics that we cite uh, at the Climate Museum really often is from the Yale Center for Climate Communications um, and George Mason University, which says that 66% uh, of Americans are worried about climate change, but only 6% discuss it often. And so you look at that number and you're like, okay, so there's a big discrepancy. And that means that there's 60% of people out there who are worried, but these like silent little islands and they're, they're shut down and they don't know where to start. Um, and getting to think of yourself as a person who can um, be part of what catalyzes people to join the conversation, um, figuring out what kind of like accessible pathways you can build for people to, you know, join the movement, join the conversation, um, and then ultimately working in um, community and uh, towards collective action with those people. And we were just talking about the strike in New York last week, and it's so um, re-energizing to be out with a bunch of people, like being reminded that it's not just on your shoulders, it's um, actually something that we can all like work towards together and, and find power and strength like in one another. Um, and that's been happening with Museums for Future as well, when you can say, you know, I was part of the strike in New York, but we're not just an isolated strike, we're connected to like a global network of people who care. Um, there's actually not that much to add. Uh, Maggie has framed it really beautifully, because I think, um, to be honest, um, you, I mean, I, I get that. And I had the same feeling like being overwhelmed when like companies tell you when like advertisement tell you like, oh, you have to be careful about like what kind of like what kind of things you recycle, like how you recycle and things like that. Like, how do you get to work and things like I mean, it's really it is overwhelming. It's like sometimes you're just like in a supermarket and you just want to buy like a couple of things to eat and you're just like really worried sick like what am I going to do to the environment about this and um so I think it's um and that actually uh, I think the climate um museum in New York City uh, Maggie probably can talk about that um later too uh you have this like great campaign that it's like about um where the uh, your uh, carbon footprint like how all of this started like how this is also um has been framed from big oil companies uh to to put all of or put the major load on individuals and i think that's really something where we have to get out and i think really one of the meaningful actions it's also like one of the things that Maggie touched upon and I think that's actually that has helped me a lot with all of these kind of like overwhelming like paralysis by analysis kind of feeling um, is really being part of a community like because there you can be with like-minded people with people who think differently than you um, like when when Maggie is actually saying like talk to other people like actually talk to people who who are a little further in the game, I would say, in taking climate action, but also talk to people who are actually very far from it. Uh, ask them, like, how, how does this affect you and your life? Like, how, how are you worried about it? And why are you actually not worried about it? And I think that's actually a good way to, to start a uh, conversation and, like, getting outside of our bubble, too. But really taking action, like, being part of a group um, is... I think one of the best ways to to start but it also is and I think that is like taking the pressure out too it's really a step-by-step -step thing it's like escalating it's like just start somewhere 
I'm, I'm all about like, yeah, talking is really good. Thinking about it is really good, but also you have to get doing something and like being part of a community is really doing something. And um, so, yeah, I think um, just like start somewhere is I think the best advice I can give. Um, it's like, it, we don't need 10 people to do climate action perfectly. We need a bajillion of people doing it imperfectly, but doing it. So, yeah. Awesome. So I wondered when we were having our sort of um, chat before we, you know, in preparation for this, um, you gave us a little bit of, you know, insight into why you why you co-founded the German um, division of Museums for Future and just, you know, what Museums for Future does in general. So uh, I think I would love that to segue into a bit more of a discussion about how we in the cultural heritage space, um, as Anna mentioned, she is a conservator, Maggie is not a conservator, but is a museum professional. So, um, you know, how we can join hands as, you know, conservators with other conservators, but also with our colleagues uh, that aren't, that are also, you know, working in our museums or our cultural institutions, or even, you know, if we're in private practice, other uh, folks in the profession. So um, I wonder if we can kind of talk a little bit about how Museums for Future has helped you guys do that and sort of what the, maybe this is getting, maybe this is too many questions, but also the sort of the political role of museums. Uh, that was something we had talked about that was super interesting to me. So um, yeah, whoever wants to take it. Uh, probably I, I will just start with that one. Um, so I started um, with Museums for Future actually in January this year uh, as a kind of like New Year's resolution. I don't know why. Um, so, but I have kept it up for, for quite a while, I guess now. So I, I've been really proud. Um, so uh, yeah, but I started with the international group. Uh, at first there was no Museums for Future Germany and I have been really inspired by the people who, um, who I found there or who have been uh, supporting museums for future and um, was actually that inspired that I was just like, why is there no uh, museums for future group in Germany? And um, I basically just teamed up with a couple of people and just started it because we also got a lot of messages of people uh, saying, hey, I, I want something like this, but like, why is it not there yet? So uh, it's really difficult for people to imagine something that is not there yet. Um, and it's actually not that difficult to make it happen. And so what we did is just like make it happen. And uh, we did that, or at least I, I feel like what was leading my or me up to this moment of found uh, of starting um, Museums for Future Germany was um, the art strikes that we had. Like uh, museums could actually participate uh, in art strikes while while they were closed um, during the pandemic. Like um, you know, just say we put objects on strike because we can physically not strike anywhere, or we can probably we don't feel comfortable as a museum to. Um, to say that we follow this kind of like uh, strike movement or things like that. So we had a lot of like online actions and uh, but now I have been really proud that uh, actually a lot of people showed up uh, in person for the last strike uh, last week actually and so but there is a lot of like different things museums and museum um, employees um, can do also people who are just kind of like affiliated to museums and their work. Um, so yeah, I think there's um, really a lot of different things um, that you can do online and in, in real life. Can you just explain the um, yes. objects on strike a little yeah. bit more? Uh, sure. Uh, we actually did uh, uh, last Friday, we actually had uh, still a couple of museums doing that. Um, so you can be uh, quite creative about it. Um, what you can do is just say, uh, for example, the, the most, iconic work in your museum is going on strike. That's like a really powerful statement. Or even if it's not the most iconic one, what if uh, the one that is um, whatever the most connected to nature or something out of plastic uh, and oil, whatever, it could be everything. So um, museums actually have a lot of like creative freedom about like coming up with their own ideas. Um, and that has been really cool. Like you can just cover it up um, and say this object is on strike. It is not available for this day um, and um, show that uh, you are part of the movement too. Love that. Maggie, did you want to add something? 
I was just going to add that um, one of the things we talked about before and um, that I think Museums for Future does really well is tap into that uh, museum superpower of being like a really trusted uh, organization by the public um, and that you can use your ability to, you know, bring different publics together and have conversations um, where they feel trust, you know, they feel high senses of trust and they also feel immersed in the conversation to talk about a climate action. Um, and, and that's something we think a lot about at Climate Museum um, as an institution that um, creates museum exhibitions all over the city. We try to figure out how can we, you know, inspire a certain emotional response or foster a, a space where people can have a certain emotional response to the climate crisis, but also use that as an on-ramp to action. Um, and I think, yeah, it's it's totally a superpower of the museum world. So it's it's worth tapping into in your institution. And I think when we were talking, um, you guys spoke a little bit about some other actions that you have done and and some things that museums can do that we wouldn't necessarily like. Um, I, I would love you to explain this, Anna, but I remember you saying something about like the third thing on the list that Museums for Future promotes is being a sustainable museum. So could you talk a little bit about those other options and um, different avenues? Because I think we think a lot, we think quite narrowly about what we can do. Um, and I love that you guys are kind of exploding that in a super creative way. And also, um, yeah, just for those yeah. who aren't okay. familiar with what Museums for Future does, maybe you could give like a brief overview and then jump into this? I realized we might have skipped ahead a little bit in our questions. <laughs> we, were so, we were so excited about this. Yes, uh, I'm happy to, um, to give a, a bit of a quick overview. So um, Museums for Future uh, was actually found, um, founded um, in the end of 2019 in Vienna in Austria uh, by a couple of uh, very um, passionate uh, museum directors and museum employees that just said like Museums for Future is now in the world. We are joining the climate strike um, with this intention of not just joining the youth climate movement, but also uniting behind the science, because that is obviously what the climate movement is actually doing too, saying that it's not just young people saying we want uh, a better future, we want actually a future, but it is the science and scientific community that is saying that we have to do everything in our powers to stay below the 1.5 um, degree um, threshold. Um, so um, that is basically how Muse Museums for Future was born. And uh, Roxy, what you have been uh, touching on was um, actually the goals that we have that we're trying to achieve with Museums for Future, uh, which are fourfold. Um, one of them is um, uh, supporting a climate strikers, actually the first one, uh, supporting climate strikers or supporting the youth climate uh, strike movement. The second one is uh, co communicating to the public. The third one is actually tr um, transform our own institutions. This is all, all goals that museums can achieve. And the fourth is um, raising awareness within our networks. And you already mentioned, Roxy, that actually transforming our institutions is only the third from four goals. Um, it is an important one. It is important uh, for us to become uh, more sustainable, to um, act sustainable when you look at the goals that in the US or worldwide have been set for governments, for countries, like being, for example, in Germany, they're saying that in 2045, we're, we have to be climate neutral as a country. That's like, I mean, it is crazy when you think about it, obviously, this is actually not even enough. Like science says that we would have to be climate neutral in Germany by 2035. And it is possible, but just imagine you, like at least most of the people sitting probably here work for museums or with museums. It is crazy when you think about museums have to be climate neutral in like 10, 15 years. Uh, so that is a big challenge, obviously. And we definitely have to work doing that. But I think, and probably that is a very, I explain it in a very German way. Like I want to be very efficient with the time I, I invest uh, in climate action. And I think actually our, or at least my individual time is very well invested in supporting the climate movement because we really have to think bigger than our own institutions. We really have to think about the whole um, thing outside of our institutions because when you think about, 
even if overnight tomorrow, every museum in this world is climate neutral, there will be still the climate crisis. Because, I mean, obviously of the 100 companies that uh, produce 70% of the CO2 emissions, none of them is a museum. That doesn't mean that we have to like, that we can lay back and like not do anything, but it also means if we want to achieve something here, we also have to address it with the appropriate action. And I think that is really supporting climate, uh, the climate movement and also the science behind it. Maggie, did you have anything to add about sort of actions that you guys were taking? I know your museum is like all about that, so. Yeah, um, one of the things that I was thinking about is actually a youth program we ran last year where students all had to develop climate action plans. And, uh, you know, one thing we noticed is that all the students came back to us with these sort of individual or like very, very micro level community climate plans, you know, get my um, family to go do Meatless Monday, which is fantastic, or, you know, uh, organize a um, eco club at my school, which is also wonderful. But we sort of had everyone come back to the, uh, the drawing board and say, how can you pair those plans with a larger collective action? Um, how can you push an institution or an organization you're a part of um, to go one step further um, in, with climate action? How can you tie a meatless Monday in your family to everybody after dinner calling their congressional representatives? Um, and, and just thinking about things as, um, you know, that can add on to one another and that you can pair in interesting ways and that you don't have to do it all at once, but you can think on multiple scales at once um, with your with your climate action um, and, and in those ways create an even bigger uh, rippling effect. Um, so we do a lot of that at the museum sort of talking about how talk can lead to call can lead to pushing your organization and that they're all interrelated and feeding back to one another. So in building on that idea, then, um, and, you know, and assuming a, a number of people in our audience work at cultural institutions, what are some things that people who work at those places could do to really try to push for positive action? I know sometimes I feel really siloed or stuck or like unable to, you know, like reach the people who actually have the power to make those changes. So like, what are some things we could do? Um, in addition to, um, I would love to talk to people who are interested about a Museums for Future network in the United States. Um, so definitely I can put my email address into the, into the chat after this so we can start that conversation. Um, one sort of uh, specific climate museum plug of like a beginning action to just start the conversation, right? And like start taking those steps like Anna was talking about to, to be along the, the path towards a bigger action. Um, the Climate Museum right now is running a campaign called Beyond Lies, um, where artist um, Mona Chalabe made these three posters that are all about how do we move beyond a, a world that's dominated by fossil fuels. Um, so the posters are about beyond individual blame, which touches on what Anna said a moment ago about uh, BP being one of the, the coining the term uh, carbon footprint back in the early 2000s, um, beyond empty promises, sort of about greenwashing and beyond business as usual about like sort of how can we participate in a larger cultural shift. Um, and so one of the ways that you could start taking action or just start having the conversation um, is, is by printing out these posters from beyondlies.org and um, bringing the posters into your, into your workplace, hanging them up in your office and like just starting to get a sense of like, oh, if 60% if of Americans are silent, is 60% of my workplace silent and worried? Um, and, and starting to figure out ways that you can tap into those, those people whom you may have never had a conversation about climate with previously. Yeah, and just to add what um, to the thoughts that uh, that Maggie had on that, um, I think as um, conservators, for example, as we are sitting here probably with um, a lot of conservators, um, I think really when we think about museums, it's not just like this pile or clump of material that has an HVAC system, right? I mean, it's, it's really not about these kind of things. And obviously it is important to talk about them uh, just like... Um, 
just uh, like Maggie mentioned, like really try to to connect with your coworkers on these kind of issues. Tell them like how climate action probably made your life better. Tell them what you're worried about. But I think also as museums, we and as conservators, we actually um, have a huge advantage of um, being a good messenger for all of this because we are ca caretakers of the cultural objects that we have not just as conservators but obviously as museums and when a lot of museums say that uh, we work as uh, as part of a scientific community like if you cannot accept uh, very simple scientific facts obviously not all of us or none of us actually have has to become a climate scientist. Like we can believe in, we know that X-rays magically work, right? I mean, these are the things that we have, uh, that, that we use on a daily basis, but um, we can actually uh, do so much more. And I think one of them is accepting the scientific facts that we really have to change something here and if we really are the caretakers that we say we are that we actually have to act on it and i think one of the things that you can do as an individual in an institution ask the uncomfortable questions too ask your board or someone uh, in your institution ask them like so if we believe in science and if we actually want to take care of the objects of the museums of the employees that are in this museum like, how are we going to reach this? Like, what are the steps? How do we get there? And if no one can answer that, I think you have achieved already a lot. And, you know, the other things are obviously uh, starting a sustainability group where it is, you can do like recycling programs and things like that. Um, all these step-by-step -step actions, but also have these kind of conversations with people, not just from your lab, but with everyone who actually works at the museum, like really try to be diverse. Everyone from like the person who sells the tickets to directors and there have been museums doing that. And that is also what we as museums for future want to provide, like um, want to, we want to get um, to, to um, get museums and people together to actually um, share their experiences with these kind of things like how did I start a sustainability group in my museum and things like that so I think that is really something that museums for future and our community wants to help uh, individuals with that's super interesting I was just reading um Catherine Hayhoe's new book about I think it's called saving us um and she talks a lot about like finding <clears throat> the sort of shared values within a community and um, and sort of like using that to make people realize that they are worried about climate uh, change. And I was sort of like, wow, this is so easy in the conservation community because it's such a it's such a like obvious reason that we have to be worried. Um, but but yeah, I was just curious. I, I know we spoke a little bit, uh, Anna being the conservator, about um, this sort of idea of like kind of macro versus micro um, conservation interventions and how do we like sort of move our field towards thinking a little bit more about like the important, like how this should be our kind of primary uh, issue that we're thinking about. Um, I don't know, does that make sense? <laughs> you had a okay. really nice way of kind of speaking to this, so. <laughs> um, yeah, I think to be honest, like there's really, um uh the conservators um around here we have been like really trained like sustainability is in our dna basically in the dna of this profession like when we work on uh on paintings for example that have been like 400 years old we can't even imagine like when when we really believe what uh or take seriously what climate um scientists are saying now like we have no clue how the next 400 years are going to look like. We don't even know how the next 100 years are going to look like. And that's insane. That's really insane. And I think we as conservators are actually, uh, we can relate to a lot of things that climate scientists are talking about with our own personal field. For example, reversibility. Uh, like we talk about that basically every single day, like about using things that are reversible. Like, in with the climate crisis, we are reaching tipping points that are 
irreversible. Like that is a concept that we as conservators do understand what irreversibility means. And this is like on a global scale. I mean, it's pretty insane. And there's like so many other things. Um, for example, uh, what I have learned in through conservation too, and I think that that would be something that applies to climate action or inaction too, is that every decision uh, or everything you do or you don't do is a decision. So if you decide, for example, you have a panel painting that has a cradle on the back and there's like a lot of things happening on the front, like first you have to think about what is actually causing my paint layer to flake uh, on like um, on the painting surface. Um, is, it, is it really the support that is whole, like holding, that has been holding in place by the, the cradle itself. And so like really you can obviously consolidate all the paint flakes you want, but you actually have to think about what is causing the problem, the symptom that I actually see. And so that is one thing that I think we can relate to. But then also if you decide in that moment not to take action, it will have consequences. And I think that is something that we should take uh, with, with us for the climate crisis. If we decide not to do anything, then this is a decision and it will have consequences. So that's why I think uh, I also, I'm like circling back to what I said in the, in the beginning. Um, it's, it's really, um, uh, what did I circle back to? Um, <laughs> Sorry, I just I totally lost it. So much um, <laughs> well, I love I love those like anyway. analogies and like the fact that we really are so beautifully positioned to speak to these sorts of things. Um, I just think that's so cool to think about. Yeah, I think we have a huge advantage, and I think it just makes it somehow relatable to our field. And um, I think it's really uh, yeah, we should be on the forefront of this mm -hmm. of this in museums, really. Mm -hmm one thing that I keep coming back to is basically like, you know, climate activism is sort of written into our job description as conservators, right? It's our jobs to preserve things for future generations. And at this point in, in time, that means that we have to work to prevent the worst of the climate crisis. So how do we get, and this is, you know, a conservation related question, but Maggie, I also welcome your thoughts on this. How do we shift the thinking within our field to help, you know, others understand that, you know, we really need to be sustainable. It's not just, you know, focusing on fixing this one, you know, piece of artwork that's in front of us, but, you know, working to preserve the climate for the, you know, hundreds and millions of, of artworks out there, because that's really what we stand to lose too. And I think conservators sometimes lose sight of everything else, you know, and they and they run the risk of really treating everything like it's a Picasso, you know, and and we can't really do that anymore, but we can take these actions to, you know, be more sustainable, to lower our negative impacts and to potentially preserve, you know, hundreds of millions of our works. So how do we get people to to see that? hope that made sense. I think exactly through those conversations we have right now, uh, just inspiring other um, people, other conservators to uh, be vocal about it and like speak up and uh, say that, I mean, at least for me, I'm, I feel like I'm still a conservator when I do cli climate activism, because I really try to help preserve culture help preserve the communities that we as museums serve um, and I think we will fail at this if we do not as museums and as people address this um, with like meaningful climate action and I think really in this case it's like showing up showing up at the strikes ask people to go strike with you if if they are not doing that, that's okay. But ask them like, what else are you actually doing? Like, um, and I mean, obviously we can't force and we don't want to force anyone. And I have been actually talking about this, um, I think before the, the session actually started, there's really a lot of ways you can, um, you can be part of the climate movement. Um, there is like, if you're an introvert, there is silent strikes. Um, you could like, 
work on a website for someone, uh, for, for Fridays for Future, for the Sunrise move, Movement, for um, Fire Drill Fridays. There's like a lot of different things where you can actually get involved in and just like try to talk to the people around you and try to also get outside of your bubble probably too and get inspired by, by those people and hopefully be an inspiration to someone else too. And I have to say it has been like ever since the first conversation that we had sort of planning this converse, this talk today where um, you three were talking about the role of conservators and like the time scales you think on and like the big questions that get asked in um, museum conservation. Like I have brought it up in every conversation. It has just been like so such like a light bulb moment for me. And as a person who works in museums and who works on climate, it has been like a huge perspective perspective you know just it's been so exciting to to realize that there are professionals within the museum space already like ready to be you know the the climate uh at the front of the climate march for for your museums and that you're already thinking about these like these questions um in ways that cool. open up new conversations <laughs> yeah yeah no i can't my my poor roommates i can't shut up about how cool it is <laughs> I, I have to say we are used to being like the unpopular person in the room <laughs> and, and speaking for the art. So maybe that's prepared us well. <laughs> Probably just two things that uh, Kate to just get back to the question that um, you were asking. Um, I think as I have seen it in the chat, like preventive conservation is obviously something where we in our field have started to think outside of like the, you, unique and individual treatment of an individual piece of uh, art to a bigger scheme, right? I, I think we're totally uh, ready and we are capable of thinking even one uh, step bigger. And when you think about emergency planning, actually a lot of conservators here in Germany, um, you might have heard about the floods that have been happening earlier this year um, in Germany, there have been actually, uh, there has been a lot of support from conservators to the museums in those affected areas. And I thought it was actually great to see the solid solidarity that conservators, uh, like they really showed up, they really helped. But then that is also not a situation that we want to be in. Like we don't want to wait for these kind of moments and we actually have to start treating this crisis like the crisis it is. I mean, when you look at the CO2 budget we have left to reach the 1.5 degree, it's like seven years. And I mean, it's with current rates uh, of rising CO2 levels, um, which shouldn't be demotivating anyone. But like, <laughs> I mean, this is really like, I don't want to go to uh, an area and, uh, I mean, you have you have been hit in 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 the U.S. actually really hard with fires, with floods, with hurricanes, uh, like all of these things. And there is a lot of museums being affected by that. Like we don't want to wait for these kind of things to happen. We want to prevent them, right? And so, like I don't know, like if let's just all go on strike or something like that. <laughs> like really, as conservators, just as a collective. Um, and make a stand like let's let's do something together that would be really interesting oh my gosh um speaking of the sort of more political side of things i know um i did want to just touch on the the uh, work that museums for future did or you guys did as individuals in in the elections in germany on a um and you don't have to like talk a lot about it but i'm just curious how how museums, especially those that are more reluctant to take a political stand, can kind of um, move the needle in that way. Um, so, I mean, we have been leading up to the to the German election. We have been really trying to um, somehow combine a lot of like different topics that normally museums would not address, like mobility, uh, like energy consumption, but all of them obviously. Uh, like a trip to the museum starts with the trip, right? I mean, people like our visitors, they have to get there somewhere, right? And so like, there's really so many connections, I think, of museums that uh, like they have restaurants, obviously people have to eat there, things like that. But uh, also where's the energy coming from? Like, 
do you do you have a sustainable energy provider as a museum because obviously a lot of things in museums need a lot of energy and constantly and also because of us as conservators right and so but we were also trying to connect um let's say like the political surroundings with museums and i mean you have all heard the phrase of museums are not neutral they're not neutral in any way like not in a political way not in a climate neutral way and and this is nothing bad but then also we have to take a stand on this like because there's also no time left to be this kind of like vague neutral entity because we're not like we're actually we cannot run our museums under these circumstances like we will fail at our mission to preserve culture for future generations if we do not address the climate action right now because obviously we are also the last generation that can actually fix this so it has been uh, a lot of things and uh yeah there but there's obviously a lot of um, museums that um have a bit of more of a conservative view of hey we're like trying to not do any political statement but this is really not about in my opinion not about politics anymore it's an ecological crisis actually multiple ones that we are trying to uh, prevent from happening and the solutions have to be political because right now we actually have to like uh, change infrastructure change all of these things and that can politic politics can only do that we got a question in the chat um has any of you looked into requirements of materials conservators allow in exhibition spaces or in showcases and looking for new materials that are better in regards with co2 footprint i know this is maybe a little beyond the scope of um, climate action, but if anybody has anything to say or how perhaps how we can like create more momentum around that um, as a community, because I, I feel like our committee gets a lot of questions about materials and, and it, it, it feels we do have some tools now, um, but it often feels quite mind boggling like you think you're doing something you're using recycling for gloves but then actually the co2 footprint of shipping them back and forth is worse than the glove you know so it, like it gets really complicated um so i'm curious if any of you have any thoughts on that i'm just going to say something very quickly here but i would be actually really interested to hear uh, maggie uh, if that is something the the climate museum with a lot of different exhibitions um is actually um or how, how you are uh, dealing with these kind of worries um but um just to be clear that museums for future is providing the space for people to discuss about these kind of things but we're also trying to be um very honest and say like this is not really like th that has been covered by a lot of people or there there is at least a lot of people who are trying to do research on these kind of things you actually had um, uh, a great talk with the life cycle assessment mm -hmm. uh, I think that actually a, a lot of like great institutions great people and experts are working on um, and for us or at least I can probably speak for for myself um, I leave these things to the experts. And mm -hmm. I think there's really, um, there's a point where obviously we have to question uh, some things or be critical about them. But also I think, as I said, like we do not have to have the perfect solutions because there will be no perfect solution. So there, it is really a step-by-step -step thing. And if there is already uh, a dozen of people uh, being very dedicated or organizations being very de dedicated to researching these kind of like material facts, I believe them and I will try to like implement them as well as I can in my practice. Uh, but then also um, say that for myself, I'm trying to like focus on something else. And as Museums for Future, we provide the space for people to talk about these kind of things, to talk about um, these kind of issues because they are important. We're trying to provide um, the space for people to exchange um, um, literature or um, things about that. But uh, we're also very vocal about there, there needs to be more and probably we need 
um, people to focus on different things. Like it's really about uh, sharing, uh, sharing your time efficiently. And that's probably um, very uh, German. Let's say like I have a very limited amount of time that I can focus on something. And if there's already a lot of people working on that um, and doing a very good job on that, uh, let's focus, or at least that's what I'm trying to do. Um, I, I'm focusing on something else, but obviously believing those people. And I did just to, before Maggie, um, I'd love to hear thoughts too. I just put in the chat the um, life cycle assessment tool that's been created. So that should give us some science and some surprising science at that. Um, Sarah Nunberg, who's uh, been involved in that is, I've had some chats with her where she's sort of like debunking all these things that we think are um, you know, good and it's so informative. So I'm so grateful for that tool. Sorry, go ahead, Maggie. I was just going to say that I think the Climate Museum is at a stage where we're more listening and, and learning about these types of things. And it, it will be really exciting to see developments out of, you know, other museums on how how these conversations take place and the, the actions that can happen. Um, but it's really heartening to see, you know, we spoke with an organization last week um, called Broadway Green Alliance that's trying to do the same thing with show production and like how do we make show production more sustainable and just by virtue of every sector having asking these questions i think we'll get some interesting answers and then then we can start having conversations about how do we share across different mm -hmm. cultural sectors um and so um, i'm going to definitely open up the link to the the resources you just put in the chat roxy <laughs> awesome um I feel like we've touched on a little bit, you know, just what a scary position everyone in the world is in right now. Okay, hold on one second. Um, and one of the things that, you know, that I've read and, and we've touched on a little bit too is just how it's really important to keep these messages positive in order to prevent burnout. And so Maggie, I'm wondering if you would touch on a little bit the thinking behind some of the um, the climate museums exhibitions and just any tips you have for how you communicate the urgency but keep it positive. Yeah, um, I one of the things that actually brought me to the museum was their their way of being able to reframe that your emotional response to to the, the climate crisis and find ways to be inspired to take action and. The first exhibition I was a part of in 2019, um, we actually created uh, the space where you were first greeted by the, the climate solutions. You were, you were reassured that we have the tools necessary to take action and cap warming. And then we, you know, you progressed through to what we referred to lovingly as the doom room, where you where you learned the obstacles that inhibit. Um, the, the solutions from being implemented. And then the third room was the, the taking action room where it was like, how do we collectively overcome these obstacles to implement the solutions? And that reframing has stayed with me for, for a really long time and, and even was, was useful across you know, the pandemic when I was like, okay, we have the solutions. What are the obstacles? Like, how can I take action to help? Like that way of, way of thinking, I think has been really powerful for me and, really sustaining in terms of uh, not feeling like we're we're starting at this place where we're in the, the thick, you know, muck of uh, bureaucracy and like, you know, US political debates and things like that, that slow us down and, and make us feel stuck and like, we'll, we'll never be able to move forward. And instead feeling like energized and empowered that there are the tools out there and uh, and that we can just be the, the people who help break down the, the barriers to those uh, solutions being implemented. But that's not to say that uh, burnout doesn't, of course, happen. And like, you have to take some days off from reading climate news every once in a while and things like that. Indeed. Um, yes, we did. I did also um, want to say that there is going to be an info session for Museums for Future is that on October 4th. Did one of you want to put the link to if anyone wants to just come and hear a little bit about that, if any of I mean, US or anybody around the globe wants to, to get started, um, I'm gonna be at that session for sure. So um, I would love for anyone who's interested to sign up, maybe we could start to see how we could um, get something going in the US. Um, but we also got a really good question in the chat about fundraising. Um, 
we have someone who works in fundraising, Hi Hope, uh, who says, I work in fundraising and I'm eager to find ways to support this work at my museum. Also, if any of you have any thoughts on creative ways of, fundra of a fundraising team uh, that could support, support these initiatives, I'm all ears. Um, so yeah, the, the minor detail of funding these sorts of activities. <laughs> Sorry, I was just um, uh, putting in the link for the sign up session. Um, funding these kind of things. <laughs> um, I mean, we we are a nonprofit, so uh, we and at least I can speak for Museums for Future Germany. Uh, we um, we are completely volunteer based. Uh, obviously, we would uh, love to at some point uh, get to a point where we are doing uh, more fundraising and things like that. Um, currently, we're really trying to do um, um, to support museums with ideas, to support museums with our network, to support museums with um, our expertise or our point of view also with our uh, networks actually outside of museums as museums for future germany we are an official uh, alliance of the for future group where uh, there's actually a lot of groups like mm -hmm. everyone from lawyers for future I've, i have actually told you about the grandparents for future or grandmas for future so there's really like everyone from engineers lawyers uh, artists creative museums um, uh, there's a lot of uh, for future groups um, so with the fundraising, that would be obviously something that is in a museum's hand that um, museums in Germany, and I can only talk about museums in Germany in that kind of sense. I know that the system in, in America is more about like private funds and things like that. In Germany, we have a lot of museums that are state owned and that um, get their funding from states. Uh, so what we are also trying to do as a community with Museums for Future Germany is actually uh, saying and telling uh, telling museums like uh, we are very reliant on who is in politically in charge because we as museums are state owned. This is where we get our money from. And we obviously, if uh, museums and museums have a high carbon footprint too uh, as an institution. Um, if we are supposed to be climate neutral by 2045 or whenever politics is going to decide that, um, then we also need the funding obviously and we need the funding from you. And that cannot come out of our uh, basically just like cultural or education budget. Like, and you have to provide that funding. We demand to have that funding and we want also you to uh, point us or to, to give us a pathway on how we can achieve that. So that would be something in Germany that we are trying to achieve with our network uh, in the long run. Um, hopefully that, that will help. But um, also one of the funding issues uh, I think is that is also complicated is uh, who is actually funding your museum that goes probably in a different direction on uh, than, than intended but uh, that would be definitely something that um, museums also should uh, should think about like who is funding my exhibitions is it someone that uh, probably prevents me from uh, being more vocal on climate action um, that is obviously affecting museums and the people who work there, but we shouldn't, we should be independent from these kind of things. Um, and so we should not rely on oil money or uh, money from uh, other uh, sources that we are actually <laughs> trying to, uh, to prevent from, uh, from getting bigger and more uh, having more influence. Mm -hmm. Did you have any comments on that, Maggie? I thought that was a, a great answer. And um, I, I agree that it's exciting to find new ways to, to fund this work. But I also think by being more, by bringing interdisciplinarity into the, the core of your museum with you know programming across arts and sciences and, and bringing diverse voices to the table, um, that certainly catches people's eyes um, and opens new doors, I think, um, that, of sources of funding and um, sources of visitors and all sorts of um, new, new avenues that your museum wouldn't have had previously. Awesome thoughts. 
I think we have. And I think um, ahead, Kate. if people check out the Climate Museum website too, I think you have info on past exhibitions as well as current work that you're doing. And that might also serve as some creative inspiration for ways that museums can, can tackle this programming and hopefully use whatever fundraising they have to, to be more sustainable or talk about it more. Totally. Um, and I would happily, um, my email is in the chat and I'd happily talk about that as, as well. Um, we have a big, if you're New York City based, we have a big um, sculptural installation and performance piece happening October 10th in Washington Square Park, um, where we could even talk about these things in person, because um, I will be there from 6am to 6pm. So um, stop on by if you're in the city. That sounds great. Um, I think we're coming up on an hour, but we have probably time for one more question. I, I would just love to know I mean, we've kind of touched on this, but um, you know, people who are sitting here who are like, yeah, I want to get, in, I want to get involved. How do I do this? Like, do you guys have some ideas for where where we could put the pressure? Where we could, what things we could join? You know, um, what local organizations we look to? I would just love to hear your thoughts to kind of leave us on a can-do note. <laughs> I, I would start by saying, you know. Um, well, you could always get off this meeting today and spend five minutes making a call to your representative. And that's going to give you like a lot of exciting, good energy going into your weekend, I promise. Um, but also, uh, like I mentioned earlier, if, if people are interested in a Museums for Future US chapter and starting to just feel like connected to a larger global network of, of people, like-minded people who are concerned about this, um, that I think can be a strong place to start. Um, and, and asking yourself other questions about what am I looking for in an organization? What can I bring to a climate organization? Like what skills do I have? Um, what skills do I want to develop? Um, can start leading you in the right direction to find even just like, you know, the city you're in climate organization, like starting with that Google search, but um, museums for future, I, I think we can be here to, to be a bridge uh, if you're unsure where to start. Um, and you, just to clarify, you don't have to be, you don't have to like have the okay of your museum to join. You could just be an individual in the cultural heritage space, right? Yeah, um, and I, I think you can describe maybe better than I could the difference between joining as an organization or an individual. Yeah, you. I mean, you can totally volunteer just like you can volunteer for anything else in your free time. Uh, you can obviously volunteer for Museums for Future, uh, either in the US chapter that is hopefully going to come uh, very soon, uh, right after the session, who knows, uh, or even if, the, if there will not be a, um, a US chapter that quickly, uh, you can still volunteer with us and uh, help to, I mean, we are a global network. You can just sit with people from Budapest and Vienna and Heidelberg and Berlin in a session like uh, once a month uh, and just like um, get talking and uh, get um, active on like doing things. Um, but yeah, um, just to add to that what, what Maggie already said, um, um, try to get outside of your bubble probably too just like see what is what is there like who's already active in your local community um actually indigenous people have been on the front lines of these kind of uh fights for a long time uh the north dakota access pipeline has been a really uh, good example where um these kind of communities that probably some of us do not associate with climate action um per se um is uh you know like is really interesting to get in touch with like go the the sunrise movement the fire drill fridays i think fridays for future is actually trying to get bigger in in the us too i think trevor noah has mentioned it on the show uh so there's like really a lot of uh people or try to get involved in like public transport in your city like this is climate action too it's it's a really uh um different but also very uh active form of uh changing uh what what could be a better city hopefully well i hope that leaves everyone on a really awesome note so we'll all call our representatives and then have a relaxing weekend um but I just wanted to thank you guys so much. And thanks everyone who came uh, for questions. Um, we're going to 
um, post this recording on YouTube. So if you want to share it with other people, uh, keep an eye out. And you can also sign up for our e-blast um, if you're an AIC member. And that it'll be included in the next one. Um, so yeah, so you can also reach out to us on AICsustainability at gmail.com, as uh, Kate just put in the chat. If you have more questions you want us to um, direct towards these uh, smart and inspiring women. Um, and yeah, I hope we can all, you know, start getting more involved in bigger action. Um, Kate, did you have anything else you wanted to say before we sign off? Um, yeah, just, you know, definitely feel like you can email us directly, like let us know what you're looking for, what you need, what would help you be more sustainable. Um, and just thank you to our panelists. This was really, yeah. really inspiring. So and I feel like I want to try to start Museums for Future uh, in the US. And so, yeah, I just, I, I love these kind of conversations. They're so energizing and they really make me so hopeful for um, the kind of world that we can have if we can all work together and, and get this done. So just big thank you. Thank you guys. It's been such a nice, uh, lunchtime convo. So <laughs> we will. Thank you so much for having us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Awesome. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye.